In this video, I'll show you how to build an extremely bright LED folding light that's so powerful it can light an entire warehouse on its own. Three, two, one, action! Looking to brighten up your next filming session, photo shooter job site? Well, I have the solution for you. These are my newest portable LED light designs. We have new and improved all in one picture, and they're ridiculously bright. 37,000 lumens per fixture to be precise. These babies shine like the sun, and if you don't have a handle on life, no problem. This has a handle on it. Nice. And a folding tripod to stand up for you. Oh. Well, I advise you not to stare directly into the light. Here's a bright idea that can help you shine a little light on your next situation. These convenient foldable light fixtures aren't just bright, they're ingeniously bright. And today, I'm going to teach you how to build one of your own from scratch in this tutorial. I started by cutting all the pieces of wood out based on the length of my LED strips and the number of them that I'd used. I also cut some pieces of wood for a small power supply box. Alright, now we can see just about everything that goes into one of these lights. This fixture will use 32 of these LED strips, which I'll talk more about later in this tutorial. We also need a power supply to run the LEDs. The simple power supply we'll build today is made of 8 of these 20 microfarad 180 volt AC capacitors. The LEDs run off DC, so to convert AC from the wall outlet into DC, we'll use a full wave bridge rectifier like this one, which can handle at least 5 amps at 120 volts AC, and a suitable heat sink to keep the rectifier cool. An electrolytic smoothing capacitor will help eliminate flickering. I chose a 10,000 microfarad 80 volt DC capacitor. Then we need a power switch. Any switch with a 4 amp rating will work, but since I want this fixture to provide two different brightness settings and I already have this nice dual position switch, I'll use a double pole relay like this one with a 120 volt coil. Of course, we'll take some time to explain the schematic later in this video. We also need some wire to connect everything together, hinges to allow the LED panels to fold, along with some other hardware, like this piece of aluminum tubing or PVC to mount the fixture to the tripod, two bolts for that tube, a handle of some kind, and a magnetic latch to hold the two panels open. Then we'll also need screws to hold the frame together, and finally some carpet tape to keep the LED strips in place while they're being screwed down. The first step is to build the wood frame. These panels are made of 3 8 inch thick plywood. To determine the size of the panels, I measured the length of my LED strips and added 3 inches to that measurement since the 1x2 boards that I'm attaching now will take up an extra 3 inches of space on the edge of the panels. To attach these framing boards, I chose 1 inch long taperhead wood screws since they're just short enough not to poke through the other side of the wood. And now that both panels are done, we can assemble a small case to hold all the power supply parts. Since we'll be screwing down the length of these 3 8 inch thick plywood pieces, it's a good idea to pre-drill all the holes to prevent the wood from splitting. And in my opinion, the perfect screw to perform the task of holding these thin pieces of wood together are these 1.5 inch long spack screws. They're a little more expensive, but they do a darn good job. One of the features that makes this fixture so convenient to set up is the built-in cord retainer. And to make it, I'm using a piece of 2x2 lumber that's been rounded at the edges, and another piece of that 3 8 plywood with beveled edges to form the back plate. Two holes needed to be drilled through the back plate to allow the power cord wires to pass through later on. And now is also a good time to drill some holes for the LED power wires. The wood frame is beginning to look good, and to keep it that way, it's a good idea to seal it up with some enamel or lacquer. You don't have to stain the wood, but I really happen to like the look of this Sedona Red, so I'm going to give everything a quick stain before sealing up with varnish. Foam brushes like this one make applying the stain really easy. For a better finish, sand down and dust off all the pieces of wood first, which I did take a moment to do just before this step. The LED strips will cover up the center area, so there's no reason to apply stain there. After 5 to 15 minutes, wipe off all the remaining stain with a paper towel or cloth. One panel done, and a quick coat on the second panel. Now it's time to show a little love to the power supply box. and to the pole support. After the stain is totally dry, we'll protect the wood from moisture by giving everything a nice heavy coat of lacquer. Normally stain would take about 8 hours to completely dry, but I cheated by sticking these wood panels in the sun about an hour beforehand which certainly did the trick. 
Lacquer is really awesome to use because it dries stupidly fast under the hot sun. Once completely dry, the hinges can be installed. It folds nicely. I'll attach this nice aluminum handle from the back of the board. And now that that's assembled, this piece can be reattached to the power supply box. Looking good. Here's that support piece that will hold up the light fixture to the tripod. I started by drilling two countersunk holes into the piece of 2x2 wood. Since the washers I'm countersinking for are 3 quarter inch wide, I chose a 3 quarter inch wide spade bit which is really the perfect tool for creating countersunk holes. And a 5 16 bit was used to remove the rest of the wood and make space for the bolts to pass through. Then the washers can be pressed into the wood piece. This 8 inch thick aluminum tube fit the neck of my tripod nicely, but if you don't have access to aluminum tube, you could also use steel pipe or electrical conduit instead. I don't want nuts sticking out on the other side of the tube to hold the bolts in, so I'm going to tap this tube later. For the 5 16 wide thread I'll be using, a 17 64 bit is used to pre-drill the hole. Threads will only be on the bottom side of the tube, so an 11 32 bit is used to clean out one of the sides to create room for the 5 16 inch bolt to pass through. And finally, a 516-18 tap is easily threading this pipe using a drill. It's a bit unconventional, but works great if your drill has an adjustable torque setting to prevent damage to the tap. These 2 and 3 quarter inch long 516 bolts barely protrude past the tube when tightened down all the way. Nice. Well, that's certainly not falling off anytime soon. To attach the assembly to the frame, I'll use some 2 and a half inch long construction screws. Then, center and attach the power supply box with some 3 quarter inch long tapered head wood screws, which also won't punch through the other side of the panel. Now the fun part. Start by laying down some carpet tape on the inside of the frame. Not only will this make screwing down the LED strips ridiculously easy, but it also helps to prevent them from warping as they get warm. Once the backing is peeled off, the strips can be laid into place. To keep these 32 LED strips from moving, 64 little screws are used. These ones are 3 8 inch long, number 6 size, and they're pan heads, which work really well since they also won't puncture through the other side of the wood. At this point, the LEDs are ready to be wired up, so I'll let you in on a little insider secret on how I got these LED strips for a tenth of what they normally cost, and where you might be able to find some too. It turns out that there's an entire industry of electronics recycling companies who make their money by reselling used or recycled electronic parts in bulk. I got in contact with one of these companies and purchased an entire 55 gallon drum of mixed LED strips which was the smallest quantity they would sell me. Even still the price was so good that after 13 completed LED fixtures I've only used $50 of what I've purchased and there are still plenty of LEDs left for future projects. Search for electronics recycling companies and be prepared to buy a large quantity if you're diligent enough to find one selling LEDs. You can also buy these online. They're called LED modules, and if you search for LED module, you'll find lots of different sizes and color temperatures, but the cost can be quite a bit more when you purchase them new. In this fixture, I run each LED strip at about 19.5 volts, where it will draw about 350 milliamps. Based on my power supply, these 32 LED strips will be split up into eight individual groups. Each group is composed of four LED strips that are in series. So each group runs at about 79 volts at 350 milliamps. So all eight groups together end up using about 78 volts at 2.8 amps. First, the input terminals of each LED strip are tinned with some solder.
then small lengths of interconnecting wire are added to those pads, which create individual groups of four LED strips each. To power all eight of these series LED groups at once, some lengths of wire were prepared by stripping back sections every three and a half inches apart and then soldering those wires to the positive and negative inputs of each group. After the other panel is wired up, it's now time to construct the power supply. But first, let's take a look at how it works. Here's the complete schematic for the fixture featured in this video, but it looks a lot more complicated than it really is. If we see what's really going on, this is what we have. Here's how it works. As AC power enters the circuit from the wall outlet, it wants to charge this capacitor here, but in order to charge it, power has to first flow through the rectifier which is connected directly to the LEDs. So the LEDs illuminate every time the capacitor charges, and each time the polarity flips around from the AC input, the LEDs light again to charge the capacitor in the opposite direction. But we don't want them to pulse on and off, so adding an electrolytic capacitor will help smooth out the energy going to the LEDs, keeping them nicely illuminated the entire time. These are the compact AC motor run capacitors I chose, and my circuit needs 8 of these in order to provide the 2.8 amps required. But if you're still kind of confused on how this circuit works, there's lots more information in an upcoming tutorial where I'll show you how to get LED strips for free, so don't forget to subscribe and turn on your notifications if you want to know when that tutorial comes out. I'm attaching these capacitors using some 5 8 inch long number 6 sheet metal screws. Now before I wire everything up, I do need to make a space for this switch to be inserted through the top of this case here. So let's go ahead and cut that out first. Now that is one tight fit, my friends. Now some holes are drilled to pass the LED power wires through. I've already fished the wires into the power supply box, but I'll first glue them down before wiring them to anything. Once again I'm using amber melt hot glue chosen for its superior adhesion strength and ruggedness. If the hot glue cools too fast, a heat gun can be used to remelt it without damaging the wood. Then the red and black wires are soldered to the positive and negative LED inputs of each panel. The rectifier can be now mounted to the heat sink. And both LED power wires can be stripped back and connected in parallel directly to this 10,000 microfarad 80 volt electrolytic capacitor. Which is also connected to the positive and negative output leads of the rectifier. That completes the DC part of the circuit. Now it's time to wire up the motor run capacitors. Taking another look at the schematic, when the dual position switch is in the low mode, only half of these capacitors will be active. In the high mode, the dual position switch sends power to the relay coil, which then connects all eight capacitors in parallel and powers them up. Of course, you could use slightly different capacitors, like these more common caps I used in the first fixture. This fixture only had one brightness setting, so all the capacitors were permanently wired in parallel. Alright, now back to the build. The black wire is connected to one side of all the capacitors. Then two individual pieces of white wire are connected to the remaining terminals of the capacitors, creating two separate groups. One of the rectifier's AC input terminals is connected to the black wire on the capacitor bank. The power cord is then inserted through the holes we created earlier. Both wires are stripped back and tinned with solder. One power cord wire is soldered to the common terminal of the switch. The other wire is soldered to the remaining lead of the rectifier. Then the pre-wired leads of the relay are connected to the switch. Alright, the system wiring is now complete. Now the heatsink can be mounted into the case from the outside using two small screws which thread directly into the heatsink. A small piece of thick insulation foam will keep the terminals of the electrolytic capacitor from shorting against the heatsink if it moves around and another small piece of foam will wedge the relay tightly against the heatsink preventing it from shifting around during transport. Finally, the power supply box can be assembled. And the last step is to attach one of these little pantry door magnets, which will keep the two panels open while the fixture is being used. Now it's time to test our creation. Alright, hit it. Wow, this folding LED fixture is impressively bright, putting almost every other LED light I've ever seen to shame. And now you also know exactly how it's made. My mechanic friends love to use these lights when they're painting, and you can see even all the way over here there's still more than enough light to work by. Hey, thanks for watching this video, I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found the information useful. But I can't wait to see what kind of projects you build, so please share your ideas in the comments section below. 
If you want to help us create videos more frequently, your donation directly allows us to afford the equipment we desperately need to streamline the video production process. We genuinely appreciate your support. Thank you so much, folks. And remember, the fastest way to access our new content is by subscribing and turning on your notifications. Links to donate and find us on social media are in the description below. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, stay bright.